تبسم 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 نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم ورسوله النبي الأمين المكين الحنين الكريم الرؤوف الرحيم أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما تحب وترضى بأن تصلي عليه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جاعل في الأرض خليفة قالوا أتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك وقال تعالى يا داود إنا جعلناك خليفة في الأرض فاحكم بين الناس بالحق ولا تتبع الهوى فيضلك عن سبيل الله صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين موشت Respected ulama, my respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. My discussion today is primarily focused on the issue of legitimacy in terms of leadership, in terms of declaring a state, and in terms of the requirements with regards to the declaration of any state and the declaration of any person as being a khalifa, a leader, uh, uh, a representative, a vicegerent, or declaring oneself sultan and so on there, and its perspective from Quran and Sunnah as well, inshallah ta'ala. We are very much aware of the fact that Dawlatul Islamiyya, the Islamic State, they've cut their name short a little bit, now they're known as Dawlatul Islamiyya, the Islamic State has made some major inroads into what we know as the Levant, Sham, as well as Iraq. Right? Almost 35% of what we know as Syria today is under the control of Dawlatul Islamiyya or the Islamic State, who's, well, lots of things I'm going to say today, by the way, is going to be very, very sarcastic. Right? and very, very tongue-in-cheek. So don't take it as being literal, what I'm saying. You need to catch the, the, the undertones there. Right? Uh, the very charismatic leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, self-declared, obviously, of the Islamic State, has now has 35% of control over Sham, Syria, as well as a large portion of northern Iraq. Currently, it is about the size of Jordan, the area that they control. Okay? And it is expanding rapidly. And they are on the verge of getting to Erbil, which is supposedly the capital state of Kurdistan, which is a non-declared state in the first place. Right? No one has recognized it as a state, but it is the capital of Kurdistan, Erbil. And you must have heard a few days ago, President Obama very valiantly and very gallantly vowed to go and help the people of Erbil and the small sectarian group called the Yazidis or Azadis, right, with regards to the onslaught by the Islamic State and so on. And they're giving a whole lot of help to the Kurdi people, particularly the Kurdish army, the Pesh Marjas as they are known, in fighting off and staving off the Islamic State as it is known, Dawlatul Islamiyya. Now the question arises, and this has been the perspective from quite a few scholars. I, I received a, 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 a memo from some, some schools of theology and council of theologians uh, recently, where it was very clearly stated that nobody recognizes the legitimacy of this so-called Islamic state, and for that matter, the khil Khilafat of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Let me clarify one matter right now. Right? The issue is not about the name. Whether you call yourself emperor, whether you call yourself Sultan, whether you call yourself Malik, whether you call yourself Khalif, whether you call yourself Amirul Mu'mineen, that is of no consequence. The point is that you've taken over land, right? Militantly, through armed engagement. You've captured places. And this is the reality of the matter. Right? And our people have become so focused on the issue of the title that he gave himself, Khalif and Khalifa, right, that we've lost sight of this. Right? And uh, some of our scholars have been very vehement in their opposition to his, 
taking on this, ti this title of Khalifa and Amirul Mu'mineen and so on. And uh, according to them, none of the ulama know of this man and neither have they endorsed this man's position from the term from the perspective of his knowledge of Islam etc etc and if you want to uh, you know humor the, the conspiracy theorist he obviously is a product of Mossad and this and that and whatever it is there and this is that whole memo it's interesting right that you know we have short-term memories right very recently when Afghanistan was taken over by the Taliban everyone granted legitimacy overnight and everyone accepted Mullah Uman as the Amirul Mu'mineen and all of these things here why because they could give it endorsement. Why? Again, because of ideology, because of school of thought, because of the, of the madaris that these mujahideen of Afghanistan against the Ira Russian war, I'm clarifying that matter, right, had allegiance to. So it was very easy for people now to give them legitimacy. So rather sarcastically, again, and let me clarify it, right, I'm saying, so what's wrong with the Islamic State? What's wrong with the Dawlatul Islamiyah? And the manner, oh, is it because of the manner in which he stole this land and he's taken over this land and occupied this land and by virtue of the murderous uh, manner in which he has mercilessly killed women, children, elderly and so on. There, and he would want in this regard, you're either with us or you're against us. What's wrong with that? I mean, really, it's for me, this is history in the making. Why? And re history repeating itself. Well, if you know history, then you will know that if you look at what we know today as Saudi Arabia, right, there were three uh, uh, periods in which Saudi Arabia was finally formed. The first portion of the Arab state, as what we know as the Saudi state, was in 1744, when they, they captured. Who were these people? Thugs. Gangsters, what we know today as hijackers, highway robbers, kidnappers from Diriya. <coughs> Okay? They were known as vagabonds, thugs, gangsters, merciless uh, assassins. Captured this area and they established what we know, which finally was to end up as being the Saudi state. Okay? In 1744, right? <laughs> you may not even know this. In 1802, Muhammad ibn Saud's uh, eldest son, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud ibn Muhammad, right? Went on with his bunch of what do you want to call them? Thugs, right? And his merry band of followers. And he went in 1802 to the holy city of Karbala, where Imam al Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, is buried, right? And in order to get some war booty to be able to establish his state, right, pillaged and plundered Karbala. And he killed 2,000 women and children. And what did he do? He took away all the artifacts, he took away all the gold, he took away all the money and so on there. And there was enough there for him to be able to plunder and pillage in order to have finance to finance his new state. You don't know history. You don't know history. That was the first portion. And the point is that he had religious le legitimacy for what he was doing. Because at that time, the Ahlul Tawheed or the Muwahidun, or as famously as they are known today, the Wahhabis, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, was his staunchest ally. And he gave him religious endorsement. That no, no, you can go ahead. You are the Khalif. You are the Amir al -Mu'mineen. You are the Sultan. You are the Imam. And so, yeah, the names changed as it went on. But the point was, he had religious endorsement. Number two was, he had the same modus operandi as what we have today with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So how is it that, hold on, Islamic State, no, 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 no. There's no legitimacy to the Islamic State, right? But when history, that's, that's now. Previously, when he was already enacted with, uh, with uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, in 1802, when he pillaged and plundered Karbala and all of that, day, that granted illegitimacy. And after that day, we seem to have forgotten that for a period of time, the Egyptians fought them, etc. I don't want to go into Saudi history. I'm not interested in Saudi history. But all I'm telling you is that the establishment of what we know today as Saudi Arabia went through all of these processes as well. Right? And from 1915 to 1927, from 1915 to 1927, Saudi Arabia and all the land that the Ali Saud family had now forcefully taken over through pillage, plunder, murder, rape, and everything under the sun was a British protectorate. That's history. That's history. It was a British protectorate. 
right? And in 1932, what we know today as formally as Saudi Arabia became one single state. Right? But they count their history from 1902 when, when they retook over the capital, which is still the capital today, Riyadh. Therefore, they celebrated the 100 years and so on there. You know, in, uh, I think, 1919, according to the Hijri calendar, you know, two years here and there, whatever it is. Right? But that is how Saudi Arabia was established. And it's called itself an Islamic state. And it had endorsement from the Wahhabi school of thought, with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the forefront. And what happened? They created major alliances between themselves and the tribes and whatever it is, including marrying within the family of Ali Sheikh as they are known, meaning Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Therefore, you have this monarchy. All of a sudden, a bunch of gangsters, thugs, vagabonds, thieves, hijackers, kidnappers became royal family became royal, the Saudi royal family. And the real royal family of Hijaz, which is Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an Umar royal family. And we've all accepted it, and we're all now in one way or the other subjects to the monarch. So rather sarcastically I'm asking, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. No one likes to hear these things anymore. You know why? It's an inconvenient truth and an inconvenient reality. And when ideology, aqeedah, is mixed into it, and politics is mixed into it, and dollars taken and achieved and, and acquired through the oil revenue is taken into consideration, then it is a very sensitive cocktail which could blow up in your face depending on whose side you are on. That's the problem. Please, let me clarify this matter once again. In no way, under no circumstances, am I ever, ever in support of this so-called Islamic State, as I am in no way, and I will ever, ever be in support of the illegitimate country, illegitimate state, which is called Saudi Arabia, which is, by virtue of definition, a privately owned entity. Saudi Arabia is owned by one family, Ali Saud family. Every inch of that land, according to them, is owned by them. And has been endorsed and recognized even by the United Nations. It's a private company. It's a private concern. That place is which houses Makkatul Mukarrama and Al Madinatul Munawwara. Right? Mathabat al Nasi wa Amna, a place of sanctuary and sanctity for the Muslim people and a place of assembly for the Muslim Ummah, is now the private property of the Ali Saud family. So why are we getting so upset with the Islamic State? They've taken over, and what are they doing? They're establishing Sharia. Like the Salafis and the Wahhabis did when they wanted to establish Saudi Arabia. They gave the same, pre uh, what you call it, uh, you know, quoting chapter and verse. But what is interesting is that in spite of the fact that there is no endorsement from the Muslim world, for whatever personal, ideological, political, financial reasons, there's no endorsement for these guys here, these guys have a massive media machinery. I watched some of the videos. I mean, the Eid greetings were brilliant, man. Yo, when initially, when the, you know, when the logo came up there, well, well done, you know, by brand shop and company and so on there, right? Uh, I thought it was Al Jazeera. Then I realized, oh, it's Al Hayat. Brilliant. And the Quranic verses are being recited, and the people are being welcomed. Come, brothers, come and, come and experience the true Islamic state. True Islamic state, wherein we will, will callously murder. Yazdis, we will callously murder and throw out Christians. Come experience the true Islamic state. You get someone from Al Trinidadi coming in there, Al Indonesia coming inside there. Experience the united colors of Islam. What you can't do in Makkah and Medina, come and do it with us in the Islamic state, Dola to Islamia. Experience real Islam, where you'll have no churches, you'll have no Christians, you'll have no Jews, you will have no minorities. The concept of Ahlul Dhimma, the protected people, will not exist in this Islamic state because we are the true Muslims. Got the point? So in their Islamic state, you can't have no Christians. In their Islamic state, you can't have Jews. In their Islamic state, you can't have any minorities there. And that's the true Islamic state. And you have to be fully covered, and you've got to follow this ideology, and you've got to do this one here, and you've got to do this. And if you don't, you're killed. Regardless of whether you're a woman, whether you're a child, whether you're an elderly person, ir irrespective. You're either with us or you're against us. Truly Islamic state. And what more? There'll be no alcohol. There'll be no TV. There'll be no all of this in here. Proper, pure Sharia. Please, brothers, accept the invitation. You're going to open it. You don't require, seriously, you look at the videos. You don't require a visa. 
You don't require a passport because the Raqqa border between Syria and Iraq, they've actually physically removed those barbed wire and everything there. And you can enter and go as you please. Why? Long as you read the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul and follow their version of Islam. You can go live there. So all those people who are dying for an Islamic state, who want to go live in an Islamic state there, right? please, go, go in your droves, go away to these countries, to this new state. Very soon it's going to grow. We all want that Islamic state, isn't it? Please, mashallah, carry on. Carry on. You'll have your, you know, your extremist version of Islam there. Everyone will be covered from head to toe, literally. Go, mashallah. How many want to go? Anyone, any volunteers? I'll pay for the tickets. <laughs> any volunteers? <laughs> well, like, tell me. Tell me. These people have been involved with Bashar, uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime and so on. There. As I keep on telling people, in the past three years, they've killed 170,000 people. They killed 170,000 people. And who? Muslim fighting Muslim. Muslim killing Muslim. Again, they have the takfiri mentality. You're either with us or you're against us. If you don't maintain the takfiri Wahhabi Salafi school of thought, and you don't establish that there, and the whole point is that the only way to achieve success is through armed struggle. Through the safe. They carry the safe in one hand and they carry the Quran in the other hand. Have you noticed that before? See the Saudi flag. They got two swords like that there. They got the little palm tree there and they got La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. History repeating itself. 100 years from that, they'll become the royal family. Thank God there's no Haramani Sharifain there. Unless, of course, they have some very you know, ambitious uh, project ahead of them, which is to go beyond the Levant and so on and come to Saudi Arabia. Because, I mean, Osama bin Laden dying, died trying. Maybe this guy will succeed. What legitimacy? What legitimacy? This is the question I ask. And you know what's surprising? That America right now, you must have heard Obama gallantly stating that, that they are going out there and they need to go and protect the people of, of Erbil and so on there. Personally, I never heard of Erbil. I had heard about, you know, in passing, you forget about those places. Why is so Erbil so important? I mean, with all the difficulties in Gaza, you don't see British planes and American planes flying into Gaza and dropping humanitarian aid from the, from the sky. Oh, there's a blockade there, air blockade by Israel. Or oh, there's sea blockade by Israel and Egypt. Gee, no, we can't do that there. But you know what? America can't stand back and see people dying like this in this condition. We are going to go and save the Yazidis. We're going to say, why? Why is there so much interest in Erbil all of a sudden? Why? Because the Islamic State now is on the verge of entering into Erbil. And Erbil is strategically important. Geopolitically, it has a major role to play because it is an oil boom town. You can write it a thousand times on a blackboard and saying it's not about oil and try and convince yourself, but the reality of the matter will be there is no moral, ethical, religious, spiritual inspiration or motivation for America dropping bombs in Erbil against the Islamic State, except for one reason and one reason only, and that is black gold, oil. Erbil now is an oil boom town. It has by far one of the largest oil reserves in the whole of Iraq. Literally to say, you know what, ah, Iraq, the rest of Iraq is not important. Let's concentrate on this one here because it has untapped potential. And who is America going to protect there? The Kurdis. By the way, you must know how strategically important this area Erbil is because even before the invasion of Iraq in 2003, Barack Obama's administration, not his administration, but American administration was already pumping money to the Kurdis to defend themselves as a state within a state, an official state within a state. Why? Because of the strategic geopolitical importance. Right now, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and a whole host of people, a minimum of 15,000 Americans, according to American magazines, are sitting in Erbil. Why in one small town, almost like the Las Vegas of the, the oil world? <laughs> The Las Vegas of the oil world. Why are the speculators there? Why are there so many Americans there in Erbil? Why are they not in Baghdad? Well, Baba, the oil is here. So they need to go and do something to protect their interests. They need to go and do something to protect interests. This is all that it is all about. And this is where we need to come to realize the situation. Right? Politically speaking right now, if we look at the Gaza situation, Right? With all the bombings and whatever it is there. The one country that we're not talking about is Egypt. Egypt is just as complicit in the Gaza crisis as Israel is. Number one. Number two, we seem to have short-term memories as well. 
Abdel Fattah Sisi, who is now supposedly the leader of Egypt, came in there through a coup. He was a general in the army. We don't want to get into who backed him and who supported him, whatever it is there. He literally bulldozed his way into government. Right? And according to the Human Rights Watch, it was one of the largest mass murders in terms of protesting and protesters in history. He killed almost 800 to 1,000 people in one shot with all the cops and the militia and everyone. They just come here and shooting. Get out. We don't want these things anymore. Right? No one's making a fuss about that. Right now, Egypt is the key player in negotiating peace between the people of Gaza right, and Israel. Forgetting the fact that this government itself is an illegitimate government. Forgetting the fact there that they've come there under false pretexts. Forgetting the fact that they do not, they're not even fit to rule Egypt. But you don't see the world jumping about that. You don't see after when during Mursi's short reign, when he wanted to become you know absolute ruler, right? You had protests galore. Now what happened to Egypt? Everyone is quiet. Smack them around a couple of times there, and what will happen? We will keep quiet. Why? Because eventually all of us just want to live. That's all. The general man on the sea just wants to live. He wants to grow up, have his children, get his grandchildren, and get, get them married, and etc. That's all he wants. Right? And as long as there is stability instead of anarchy, they don't care who's ruling, Baba. But the point is, the war is not about the people. It's about what the, the, the geopolitical importance, right? It's, it's, it's importance to economy and finance and all of these things here. And this is the reality of the matter. But what is very, very concerning is that we as a Muslim community, we are a very large number internationally. We know that, right? There are so many Muslim countries, over 56 Muslim countries, well, 57. Or it could be in the next month or year, you know, if America comes in there and you know comes in there and, and once again liberates Kurdistan, you will have a new Kurdistan, which they wanted to do in a long time ago, simply because you know why if they had an independent Kurdistan, independent of the rest of what is known as Iraq, right, they'll have the lion's share in terms of oil. Right? If they come and they, well, we'll have 58 countries all of a sudden. But the point is, none of these countries, historically speaking, have had much legitimacy in terms of its leadership at all. At all. And no one can stand up here and justify to me in one way or the other that this is an Islamic state. This is based on Sharia. Ah. This is based on Islamic law. The very premise upon which the so-called Islamic state is being built, wherein minority Christians who lived there for hundreds of years, thousands of years, are being forced either accept Islam, or pay the, 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 the jizya, or get out. What Islam is this? Whose Islam is this? The Prophet's Islam. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a stupid question. If a Jew wanted to come and stay in Medina, would anyone allow them? Leave the Saudis out of it. Really? What do you think? Good idea. Tell the Jews, why are you wasting your time there? We've got enough space in the rest of the Muslim worlds around there. You know, put one settlement here, put one settlement there, put another settlement here. Live comfortably. Would we allow it? Al Madina Tul Munawwara. No. Why? Why not? Why not? What? The Jews didn't live in Medina before. The Jews, Jews weren't co-signatories on the, on the charter of Medina. I'm just giving a little bit of chawi, you understand? <laughs> they were not part of the constitution of Medina. Right? Yes, we know they renegated in Uhud and Ahzab and so on. But the Prophet in spite of all of that, they allowed them until they moved. We know the history. But the point is that they were citizens. And they were, their rights were recognized. Right? They, 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 they did in, in terms of the domestic issues with inheritance, marriage, divorce, and all of these things here, they still did, dealt with all of these matters in terms of their mosaic law. The Prophet did not impose his sharia upon them in spite of the fact that he's the final prophet of Allah with the final message, with the final book of Allah, which which uh, kulli, which cancels and negates every other sharia. He didn't tell him, he said, no, rule according to your mosaic law. Same laws of inheritance, same laws of divorce, same laws of nikah. I'm not going to impose this on you. What happened there? Which prophet of Allah does Abu Bakr Baghdadi in Islamic State follow? What? Who follows this? Well, what's interesting? In this day and age, all the, you know, the extremist factions in the Middle East, particularly in Israel and so on, debt to the Jew, debt to the Arab, debt to the Zionists, debt to Israel, debt to the Palestinians, debt 
Everyone needs to die, which is going to happen anyway. Death to everybody. No one is talking about life for anybody anymore. You've heard that. You heard it. Death to Israel, death to the Arabs, death to the Hamas, death to Gaza, death to this one here, death to life for whom? Life for whom? Because if Israel is dead, Hamas is dead, the Gazans are dead. Yeah, solution to the problem. There'll be no Palestine, there'll be no Israel. Maybe Islamic State can take over. <laughs> but this is a sad state of affairs. We've forgotten that we coexisted for thousands of years together. We've forgotten that. And that hatred that we display towards ordinarily, you know what, towards the Zionist in terms of their policy has now without any realization whatsoever, consciously or unconsciously, gone beyond that pale there, where we are like the Jews, look at every Arab, and like the, generally the whole world looks at every Muslim as a potential terrorist, we are looking at every Jewish person as a potential target. And we are spewing out our hatred. Let me give you one incident. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a man by the name of Mukhairik al-Israeli. He was a Jew. He was a rabbi, okay? He was a citizen of the city of al Madinatul Munawwara. When the Prophet called for the protection of the state of Medina, right? During the Battle of Uhud, the Jews were constitutionally bound to participate in the war because they were equal citizens recognized by the constitution of Medina of al Madinatul Munawwara. And the Jews, because the war took place on Yawm Sabt, the day of Sabbath, Saturday, the Jews said, told Mukhairiq, he said, hey, Baba, you've got a constitutional uh, duty to support the Islamic State and to uh, defend the Islamic State. They told him, no, no, you go and fight today, Yom Sabt. We're not allowed to fight on this day. But he says, you know what, constitutionally, it's your greater right to do so. Eventually, cutting a long story short, Mukhairiq, Yahudi, the rabbi, went and fought with Rasulullah sallallahu in the Battle of Uhud, fighting against the kuffar of Makkah in keeping up to his alliance that he swore to as a citizen of Medina. And he informed his children and family. And he said, if I die in this battle, then I'm giving you a wasiyah that take whatever I own and give it to Muhammad Rasulullah and ask him to dispense with my property and utilize it for the ummah and for the Islamic State as he so sees fit. Mukhairik died fighting for the Muslims in the Battle of Uhud. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he found out, he said, where is Mukhairiq? They said he passed away, he was martyred. He said, Mukhairiq khayru Yahudin. Mukhairiq was the best Jew ever. I know he's buried. <laughs> in the graveyard of Uhud. He's buried in the graveyard of Uhud. So I ask you a question. When we have dreams of establishing an Islamic state, if that, and part of that, is to the exclusion of any religious minority. We've got to rethink our Islam. We've got to rethink our Islam. In the era of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, an elderly, very elderly Jewish man who was partially blind was sitting there begging on the streets. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu happened to walk past. And he saw this elderly gentleman begging there. And he didn't like it. He said, why are you begging? The man didn't know who Umar ibn because he couldn't see. He was partially blind. He says, well, you know what, I have to pay jizya. What is jizya? Tax. You know, like you and I pay tax of zakah, right? So the people who are not following Islam, they also have to pay tax for the running of the state. The state expenses. He's paying tax. He said, I can't afford to pay the tax. Therefore, I'm begging here in order to fulfill my tax. Umar ibn Khattab immediately went to Baytul Mal and he made a declaration. All elderly people, pensioners as we call them today, are not eligible for tax anymore. In fact, we must give them pensions. He picked up the Jewish man there and he told him, go away, you don't have to pay tax anymore. This is the decree of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. What happened to that Islam? Maybe Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi may read some history. Maybe you can send him a history book. Hmm? These are the things we need to wake up on. Right now, with all the debt to this and debt to that day, we need to start working towards life. We have a history with people who are supporting the Muslim cause and the cause of the people of Gaza who are from the Jewish communities. I'll give you some names of these. Things. They are not here. They didn't come into existence simply because, uh, you know, we have a problem now, right? They've been there for years for engagement between the Arabs of Gaza, the people of Gaza, and the people of the occupied territories and the Jewish communities. And they've had interfaith dialogues and in discussions and so on to try to understand one another. 
right? One of the groups is called Open Hillel. Another group is called, Jewish Americans called, If Not Now, When, right? In Israel, there's a, there's a group called All That's Left, right? All of these groups, right, are part of this movement forward to try and create some degree of understanding between the Arabs and the Jews, right? Right now, right now, <laughs> I like this term. Uh, you know, they say, you know, we, we're the militant Muslims, right? Right now, you get, you got, you've got plenty of Gentile Jews, <laughs> right? But the point is, we've got to get a gentle Jew and a mild Muslim. What happened to that? Instead of a Gentile Jew and a militant Muslim, can we have a gentle Jew and a mild Muslim? We're not talking about state politics here. We're talking purely based on the, on the pre uh, premise of humanity. How long are we going to spew out this hatred which is getting us nowhere? Really, this is a long-term solution that we need to work with. We can't ignore it, we can't turn a blind eye to it, and we can't say, refuse, no ways. Debt to them and debt to them. That's from the Islamic way. When you see them inclining towards peace and engaging in a ceasefire, then incline towards them peacefully as well. And place your trust in Allah. What happened to that strategy of war? Or do we know better than Quran? Think about this for the truth fire. Our support for the, for the, for the, for the, for the freedom fighters of Gaza is there. But in terms of strategy, We've got to tell him, hey, hold on a minute. You stick to the dictates of Quran and Sunnah. If you see a strategy not working, and if you're going against the, the strategy of Quran and Sunnah, or not in keeping with Quran and Sunnah, you've got to revisit your strategy. Because Allah tells you that Muslims will be more inclined towards peace than towards war. Yeah, bitter pills to swallow. Very bitter pills to swallow. But you've got to stand up for truth, even if it be against yourself. That is the reality and the requirement of justice in Islam. And we need to start learning that. Allah give us tawfiq and hidayah, inshaAllah.